The Transmitter. Hello, welcome to Synaptic, our podcast that looks at the people, the research, and the challenges of the neuroscience field. Synaptic is put out by The Transmitter. I'm an editor at The Transmitter. I host this show, and my name is Brady Huggett. All right, today let's go back to 1948, and let's go to Waltham, Massachusetts. That year, and in that location, Brandeis University was founded by the American Jewish community as a way to combat the discrimination that Jews, ethnic and racial minorities, and women faced in higher education. The school was named after Louis Brandeis, the first Jewish justice of the Supreme Court. And that first year, the school opened with 107 students. By 1961, the school had earned Phi Beta Kappa accreditation. That's pretty rare. Only about 10% of U.S. colleges and universities are awarded this, according to Phi Beta Kappa. Anyway, the point is, the school had grown into a prestigious private university by the mid-1960s, when Eve Martyr showed up. That's today's guest, Eve Martyr. She arrived on the campus of Brandeis, and after her freshman year, she declared a politics major. But in her sophomore year, she took a class on modern government in Western Europe, a class she described as being awful. It had a big black textbook she had to carry around, and inside the covers, the text methodically went through the countries of Western Europe and listed out the 13 or 14 political parties for each one, she said. Each party had an acronym, and eventually they all blurred together on the page. She hated the course, she said, found it hideously boring and not very well taught. So when it came time for the final, she took down the textbook, read it throughout, and lodged its contents into her brain. And when the final was over, she pushed the delete button, she said, on the whole course, and promptly forgot it. And then she changed her major over to biology, completely resetting her future. We talked about that on this podcast, how that change led her into a life of neuroscience. And we also talked about why she chose to work in crustaceans and the stomatogastric ganglion. And near the end of our interview, she talked, quite movingly, I thought, about why we do science and what it takes to be a leader in one's field and what it took for her to become a leader in her field. And she talked about why it's harder for her to speak her mind now than it was when she was first starting out, decades ago, back when she was often the only woman in the room. All that coming up in the next hour and a quarter or so, I interviewed Eve on May 7th, 2024, in her home along the waterfront in Boston's North End. It's a nice day in Boston, sunny and in the 60s. She lives in a condo with views of the water with her husband, Arthur Wingfield, though he was sequestered away while I was there so that she and I could record. I put mics on a table, and we got down to it. So let's pick it up here, where she and I are talking about how she's been living in that condo for almost exactly 16 years. That should be enough to get us started. Here is your synaptic episode with Eve Martyr, starting right now. Sixteen years yesterday. So here in this spot. In yeah. this spot. But in Boston, you've been here um, since nineteen seventy-eight. So a long time. Yeah. But I think that you're actually a New York City. You're from I'm, my current hometown. Yes. Yeah. So when I was born in at Columbia Presbyterian, one hundred sixty-eighth Street, uh-huh. and I um, grew up first in Manhattan, then in northern New Jersey, and then in Westchester. And then I went off to college. Huh. But you, so the Manhattan part, um, you, what did your family do? Were they, you, so this is the Upper West Side? Yeah. Yeah. So what did your parents do? So my, um, my father, by, at different times, he, he built a marketing research firm. Uh-huh. And so he was, he was based in New York City. And my mother was... It's sort of complicated, but my mother was first a housewife, and then she became a very fine peace movement and uh, photographer Mm. and activist. Mm. And so she left a ton of really beautiful 
um, movement photographs from the 60s and 70s and early 80s that after she died, we gave to the Swarthmore uh, Peace Archive. So where, was she doing that locally or would she travel the country to photograph? She was mostly based in New York. She was a hardcore New Yorker. Um, so she traveled some in the Northeast. She traveled some, but mostly she was based in the Northeast. Yeah, so she grew up in the city. She, grew, she was born in the Bronx. She grew up in the Bronx. What about your father? He was born in Vienna, and they left Vienna in 1938. Uh-huh. And they went to Italy for nine months until my grandfather brought the family to New York in 1939. 39, okay. And do you, you happen to know how your parents met? Um, in college. They did? Yeah, CCNY. Uh-huh. And they, they settled in the city? They first... Well, it was a little complicated. They met, um, my father was doing supposedly engineering. My mother was one of the first women to actually be admitted because CCNY was all male. And then she, I think, was in the first class or one of the very first classes that any women were led into City College. Huh. And I'm not sure if it was actually Hunter or City at that point, but she eventually got pregnant and then she left school um but she later went back did did you ever talk to her about that um you know being the first one into cc into the city college um not much she because since she left um after her first year she always viewed it as a bit of a failure and so she was one of the most intelligent articulate and outspoken, well-read people I've ever known. But she always had a sense of failure that she hadn't graduated from college. And we kept on saying, go back to school. And she went back to school at the age of 61. 61. 61. But the, the failure was because she got pregnant, right? Yeah. So it's not like she flunked out or something, but she oh, just no. wanted the degree and was upset she didn't get the degree. She felt diminished because she didn't have the degree. Yeah. It's not that she... Um, Yes. Couldn't do the work or anything no, like that. No, and I'm not sure what the politics of the time were, whether uh, a female student who was pregnant was allowed to be enrolled. Oh, I didn't probably, think of that. Probably not. I wouldn't. I mean, if you're a journalist, you might research that. I yeah. suspect it was not allowed. It just sort of frowned upon. Like if you're gonna... It might have been frowned upon. It might have not been allowed. Wow. Because remember, those were the days. Yeah. She was married, though. No. Oh, she, well, oh. she was, well, not when she first got pregnant, but she did marry my father, yes. Yeah, okay. But she got, she, they got married in, in 1946 because my father was then supposedly draftable, even though the war was over, and my mother was pregnant, so they got married because... Uh, a man with a pregnant wife was now draft deferrable, and he didn't particularly want to go back to Europe to yeah. do cleanup action. So. Yeah. Okay. And so this, your father, was it, it was his own firm? Was he like an entrepreneur? Or he... He, well, he started, out, he started out in physics and then went to, he went to a couple of graduate programs in sociology when he was teaching physics to returning GIs, and then... He became very, very interested in decision making. And so he left school at the point when he had two, two small children. He left school and got a job doing research in an advertising agency. And he rose in those ranks until he was going to have to leave research and move into advertising, which he didn't want to. So he started his own firm. And he started his own firm in 1960. And so it was a market research firm. And what he did is he developed a lot of the tools that are very common in market research today are tools that he developed because he wanted to turn decision making into a scientific enterprise. Instead of like, here's my gut on this company, but actually, but so all markets or was there one area he was specifically focused on like the auto market or? No, he would, he would work for anybody who would pay him, but he always refused to work or was tried to avoid working for anybody in politics because he said his tools were too good. He didn't want to influence elections. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. 
Do you have a brother or a sister? I have a brother who's um, three and a half years younger than I am and a sister who's 12 years younger than I am. Okay. So do you know the reason why they move out to New Jersey? Uh, yeah. My, at that point, they were living on the Upper West Side in a five-story walk-up with, you know, and my my mother just had my brother. So yeah. two small children in a very small city apartment in what was then the slums, yeah. the Upper West Side. They were on... Um, 86th Street between Columbus and Amsterdam, which was at the time a slum. Yeah. So they moved out to northern New Jersey to have a little more space and to have a little more freedom for us. Yeah, this is like a tradition of New right. York. You have children, you need more space, you, you right. need the city. Right. Yeah. I mean, your mother, was she upset about that, being a lifelong New Yorker? I think she probably was, but she was, at the time, she was doing her best to be a very good mother. Um, she had been orphaned as an infant, um, so I think she was in the 50s. She was doing her best to be a very good mother. Yeah, and was she she wasn't doing any photography then? No, when you guys were young. Yeah, no. okay. So you're out in I think was it Ridgefield? Is that Ridgefield. right? Ridgefield. Yeah. Okay, um, but not for that long. A few years, maybe. We were there between when I was four and a half to ten and a half. Ah, also, yeah, so was six time. years, and then we moved to um, Irvington, New York, which is right on the Hudson. Yeah. Um, when I was ten and a half, so I did kindergarten through fourth grade in Richfield. I did fifth grade to the end of high school in Irvington. Irvington. I don't. I mean, I kind of think I know what Irvington's like because I know those Hudson towns, but I don't know. I'm not sure I've ever been there. Irvington was at the time a very small town. It was lily white, unlike Terrytown, which was just to the north of it. Uh-huh. Terrytown was a very integrated town, and Irvington was basically had. Um, some Irish Catholic, some Italian Catholic, working class, and then it had just the very beginnings of a commuter group, of which we were part. Mm-hmm. And then, but most of Remington, most of the land, were these really large, rich estates where rich people from New York had acres and acres with big stone mansions on it. So it was very bucolic. And the schools turned out to be very good, and they were very good because there were all these people who paid a lot of money in property taxes who didn't have any children. Mm. So the kids, most of the kids came from a very small set of sort of housing areas in the town, and then the rest of it was just open fields. So uh, how was it formed? Was it formed by people leaving the city who wanted more land, or they got rich and left the city? Like that? I don't know, because yeah. it was formed, you know, 100 years before. Yeah. These yeah. were the, the people who were there. Probably they left to get fresh air yeah. in the 80s, probably. Yeah. When the, the last 80s. When they're, yeah, the 1880s. Yeah, 80, right. the, probably. The, I don't know. I mean, one could find out. But so, you know, your dad was still going into the city? Yeah, he was taking the train. Yeah. Remember, he he was very careful. He took the train down to Grand Central, and when he established his business, he got office that was, you know, one or two blocks from Grand Central. So he went in and out on the train. But, I mean, your neighbors, the kids that you knew, they were their parents commuting to, or they were just Irvington? They lived there and worked there? We lived in this little development that was built sort of as a planned development that was relatively new for Irvington. And people did all sorts of things. They were not the real townies. Yeah. The real townies lived on Main Street. And those were blue collar people, you're saying? Those were blue collar people. Those were the sons and daughters of the people who ran the gas station and the the post office and those sorts of places. Yeah. Okay, but so you had a good school there. But Irvington High School in particular was spectacularly good. And I didn't realize it at the time. I didn't realize how special it was until many years later. Mm thinking back about the high school education that I got, comparing it to certainly if Little Irvington High School, public high school in a small town, was probably better than any high school that any of my students today ever went to. Really? Oh yeah, it was spectacular. And so it was drawing talented teachers from the city or from all over? They were drawing talented teachers from wherever, but they, I think they were paying them. Oh, well, that would draw people. I think they were paying them pretty well. Yeah. Um, because most of my teachers were, my biology teacher um, later went back and got a PhD, and she 
she was so so good that remember my my graduating class this is a very small town so mm. my graduating class was 80 students and the one before had been 60 students so she had three or four sections of biology every year and she had an 800 on the SATs every year someone in her class would have an 800 on the SAT every year wow so and that's out of 60 or 70 kids right so that's that's really unusual so, so this sounds like a combination of both like smart, smart kids, but also teachers that were pulling the best out of them. Teachers who did, by today's standards, I mean, I realized I wrote probably three 100-page term papers in high school. Are you serious? I'm On now, what? Well, in my senior year in English, I wrote a 100-page paper on Whitman's poetry, on, you know, um, I wrote a really interesting paper in 10th grade for social studies where I looked at the, um, how the abolitionist movement and the Civil War dealt with, um, I got a whole bunch of different textbooks uh-huh. and I read a whole bunch of stuff. Like I read W. Dubois and afterwards and all sorts of things. And I looked at black history in the textbooks of the time and compared it to what scholars were saying. And I wrote, you know, this major term paper doing an analysis of how black history was dealt with in the textbooks that we were studying. Versus what you thought was a real, a more real history. Or at least the history that one read, if one read the scholars of the time and the the writers of the time. That was term paper number two. Term paper number three of that sort was, let's see, I did something about Karl Marx. I used to go down to the library, the New York Public Library, and I read all of Marx. Um, I don't remember what the the point of that one was, but so those are the three I can remember right off. The did bat. you do anything with them, or I mean, no. beyond pass them in, you didn't try to I don't know get them no. published or no? No, well, I yeah. was I was a tenth grader. Still, I mean, the one on I mean, the history sounds yeah, but and they're and they're long and they're lost. You know, yeah. they're just. They were, you know, yeah. they were just lost. Well, this this sounds like growing up. That maybe was your interest science growing up, or I just liked I just liked everything. I was um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I told people, and this is a very funny story. When I was about eight, I was reading um, a science book because what I did in Richfield, Richfield was a very small town. Yeah, and what I my mother had taken me to the library, got me a library card. The library was four or five blocks from my house, so I used to walk there. And I was a very systematic child. I sat and I read every book in the first grade shelf. And then I moved on to the second grade shelf and I read every book. And then the third grade shelf and I read every book. And then the fourth grade shelf and I read every book. The fifth grade, regardless, I just read them. When, when did you start doing this? So in first grade, you went through first all the first grade. grade and then just kept methodically moving Well, up after the line. I finished everything in first grade, I started on second grade. Yeah. So by the time I had reached fourth grade, I had finished all of the elementary school stuff and I was starting to read other things. But, but the irony is that that meant that I had read because one of the things the library had were textbooks for various and sundry school systems. So by the I had read most of the textbooks used around the country in all these different fields. But I started telling you this story because one of the one day I was reading a science book and my aunt, who became a who was an opera singer, asked me what I wanted to do in my life. And you know, this is one of the, the what I wanted to be when I grew up, right? Yeah, yeah. This is one of the most hated questions, right? So I was looking down and I said, oh, I'm gonna be a scientist. And she said, oh, that's nice. And so from then on, I always said that because it shut, it finished conversation. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, it was the fastest way to get, keep people out of your hair, was to tell them you're gonna be a scientist when you grew up. Yeah, but you did become a scientist. I did. So I really liked science. I really liked English. I really liked poetry. I really liked history. I, it could have been anything. I mean, do you, even today, looking back, do you find, do you know that that's unique to have just methodically read through every book that you can find? I mean, I I'm like sure to read other, too. I'm sure other people have done that. I, I'm sure they have. But it was a very small library, so it was oh. easy. Mm. You know, there was a shelf. To, yes, I just read it. So, you know, I read all, you know, those awful books about explorers yeah. and all the history books, and I read biographies of whoever, 
I read the science books and um, it just- uh, Was that when your main pastime then was reading, it sounds like? I was reading and, you know, I'd play outside. Yeah. Because yeah. we were, you know, we were in a little place. There's, you know, all, my mother used to throw us out and say, go play. <laughs> Right. This was the day, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And those, you know, I used to roller skate. I used to ice skate. I mean, I, you know, I used to with jump rope. I used yeah. to play outside. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's not like you read every moment of, of your life. Yeah. No, no. I mean, this was my mother wouldn't have let that because yeah. she didn't want us in her way, right? Yeah. yeah. You know. All right. So when you're you're finishing high school, you, you're telling people that you want to be a scientist. Although, did you really? No, want to do, no, no. At that point, I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. Oh. Because I had gotten very involved in high school this was the story about how i ended up writing that term paper yeah in the local civil rights we had a youth for civil rights group which is a bunch of kids who were sort of very early on in the civil rights movement and then we had high school kids and then there were some college age kids including a couple of the older older guys had gone down to mississippi uh in the voter registration this was in the in 63, 64, 65. Yeah. Yeah. I graduated from high school in 65. Yeah. So, um, no, I was going to go off and become a civil rights lawyer. Can, can I ask, was your yeah. mother into activism yet? Was that any part of your decision? She was, it wasn't part of my decision, but she certainly wouldn't have. Um, yeah, she wouldn't have frowned on that. No, and by that point, she was, well, they were both, at that point, they were both fairly politically active and she was a little, probably a little more than my father. Um, but her, this was the anti-nuke, it would have been more at the beginning, it was more the anti-nuke protests. Uh -huh. And so when I did a 50 mile walk from Austin to whatever, you know, she drove me there and picked me up and you know, it's, uh, so and she was involved with some of the adults in the neighborhood, you know, who are, doing various and sundry things. Yeah. She hadn't started to take pictures yet. Um, she started taking pictures a little bit later. So you're thinking about going to law school then? I was thinking, first I had to go to college, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, I was thinking about going Eventually to law school. Aware. Okay, so then... Wh what I, happened? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know where you <laughs> went to college, but tell me tell me the process. So I am... Um, I went off to college. I ended up going to Brandeis, which was my third choice, because my uncle had said, oh, you have to go to Radcliffe. And I went off on the train, and I went and interviewed at Radcliffe. And um, the woman who interviewed me looked down, and she said, well, we've never had anybody from Irvington High School. So how do we know that you're, which were then, of course, spectacular grades, yeah. that they mean anything? And I said, well, that's what the SATs are supposed to be for, <laughs> to, to level the playing field. And she said, Oh, yes, I suppose so. And then she looked at me and she said, Oh, um, well, I'm sure you'd be able to do the academic work here, but you know, we're really looking for the right sort of young woman. What does that mean? I understood exactly what that meant. That meant she didn't need a bright Jewish kid from Westchester County. Because they they weren't allowed at Radcliffe or no or they just because they had they had you know if I had played the cello brilliantly I would have been special but I was just a bright Jewish kid from Westchester I County see. remember this was still a tremendous amount of anti-semitism yes yeah and there was still and there were a lot of bright Jewish kids from Westchester County right so and I I didn't have that you know I wasn't a world-class ice skater, I wasn't a world-class cello player, I wasn't a world-class something that would make up for the fact that I was Jewish. I see. So it wasn't the fact that you were Jewish so much as you were just another smart Jewish kid from Westchester County. You had to stand out in some other way. Right. Huh. That's the way I understood it. Yeah. And then I was also a little politically active and that might have hurt. Yeah. You know? But I'm assuming your SAT scores were quite spectacular. good. Yeah, spectacular. Yeah, <laughs> spectacular. Right? So, okay, so then that Radcliffe was your number one choice? That was my number one choice. And that was because when I went to visit, I walked through Harvard Square and there were all these really interesting looking guys with their green book bags and, yeah. you know, it just looked like yeah, yeah. a cool place to be. My second choice, or maybe my first choice, was Swarthmore, mm. which also, which at the time was the place to go to if you were in my cohort, the bright Jewish kids from Westchester County. The 
the acceptance rate at Swarthmore for us was one in 30. Huh. It was very, very, very competitive. Yeah. And I knew that if I'd come from Oklahoma, I would have gotten in. Yeah. If, I'd got, if I had applied to Radcliffe from Oklahoma, I would have gotten in. But, you know, I was at a competitive disadvantage. So I was waitlisted at Swarthmore, and I was rejected by Radcliffe. And I looked at that, and I looked up the numbers, and I said, hmm, anybody who got waitlisted at Swarthmore and rejected by Radcliffe, that means Radcliffe was, just, was discriminating. Because, you know, I said... But Radcliffe had nowhere the same kinds of numbers. So I said it's much oh. harder statistically to get into Swarthmore. I see. So I knew that, that yeah. Radcliffe had actively discriminated. Yeah. And then many years later, when I really understood things better, I realized that I was probably in the top 20% of the Radcliffe class. I mean, admissions, right? They really had discriminated. Yeah. Because I yeah. would have been, with the grades... But I had no legacy, so I didn't come from a high school they knew. I had no legacy attachment, I had nothing, and I, you know, so, but I must have been numerically in right that there. top 15%, yeah. top 20%. Yeah. Okay, so then, but I mean, Brandeis is not, I mean, Brandeis is not like your local state school. Brandeis was at the time a brand new school. When I visited Brandeis, the campus was covered in mud because they were, right? Brandeis was established in 1948. In 1964, when I was interviewing, they were building. It was uh -huh. all brand new. It was very exciting. Yeah. But it was, you know, it wasn't the Ivy Leagues, yeah. right? It wasn't the established Quaker school that Swarthmore was. Yeah. And it wasn't Harvard Square and, you know, the Harvard Yard. It was brand new, brash, filled with mud. And, you know, and I walked into the admissions office and I looked at the guy and he looked down at my folder and he said, you're exactly the kind of applicant we're looking for. Translated, you're a bright Jewish kid from Westchester County. And my my uncle and aunt had been there. That's how I knew about Brandeis. Oh, they gone there? No. Yeah, my aunt, my my. My uncle, who's my father's brother, um, married a woman who had gone there as an undergraduate, and he was there for a master's. So they knew about Brandeis, which is why I knew to apply. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so that I mean, that must have felt good to walk in there, and they said, "No, you're exactly what we want." Versus, well, I knew. I mean, yes, no, it did. But but I also rolled my eyes and I said, "Yeah, they want to bring Jewish group." Yeah. Right. <laughs> it wasn't so. Um, probably. At the time, the time I was there, from 65 to 69, my classmates were probably a smarter and more interesting cohort than I would have found anywhere, anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just a really exciting time, and so. Um, so I mean, my understanding is Brandeis was formed to take in Jewish kids who were um, had been not, you know, because of quotas at other schools, they had not been able to get into those schools, and Brandeis was going to be their school instead. It was not only Jews. It was it was yeah, formed for minorities. two reasons. It was formed for two reasons. One is to provide faculty positions for the Jewish and other scholars who were unhirable, yeah. and to create an institution that would take these kids. So, yeah. you know, Brandeis's early earliest faculty included women and communists and blacks and gays. You know, it was really very ecumenical from at the faculty level and as well at the student level. So yes, it was it was a very um, interesting and exciting place from that point of view that at least, so yes, all of the above. I mean, is it like, so, so then your classmates are people who maybe felt the way you felt when Radcliffe was like, you know, when you're not quite what we're looking for. Did you feel like, um, you know, these are my these are my people. This is the school for me. Because obviously you've been at Brandeis a long time. Yeah, it was certainly as a as a college student, I was really happy there. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot. There were really a lot of smart kids. Yeah. And yeah. and people were, and they were very quirky and they were interesting and they were poets and philosophers and artists and, um, you know, dancers and all sorts of things. And there were a few of us who were interested in science. So I started out intending to be a civil rights lawyer. Yeah. But I think also, I, I don't know where I picked this up, but you were young. You were 16 or something like that when you started I, college. Is that right? I graduated high school in, I was just, I was, I just had turned 17. So not that young, actually. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I was I was a year ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then, I mean, obviously you do not become a civil rights lawyer. What, what happens at uh, Brandeis to, to push you okay. on this other track? What happened is very funny, okay? Um, so my freshman year, I had sort of placed out of chemistry. I had placed out of the basic biology course for non-majors, but I took politics one, which was a very theoretical political science course. I took psych. I had um, French. I had I had five courses each semester, uh-huh. and included in them was this year-long humanities course, which was wonderful. And I had a woman professor who was wonderful, and this year-long politics course. Um, and I really loved this politics course. And you have to understand, it was really, it was really political philosophy, you know, starting from the way down and going up, and. And I did, and I took math, and I they they stuck us in a math course that was way over our heads. But anyway, that was fine. So um, I get through it all, and I declare as a politics major. Huh. And but I I was worried because I realized that I I placed out of enough science, and I had done math, and and I placed out of chemistry and biology that. I, if I didn't take more, I would never do it again. And so I said, I'm going to miss it. So I was sort of saying, well, I can always go to graduate school in English if I'm a biology major, but I can't go to graduate school in biology if I'm an English major. So I said, okay, I'll take biology and chemistry in my sophomore year. Just in case. Just in case. Okay. This was a just in case. Yeah. And because I thought I might miss the science. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I signed up the first semester of my sophomore year. I signed up for a course, the ne- one of the next politics courses, and it was the politics of Western Europe, modern modern government in Western Europe. And it was taught by a guy who I later called the Toad. <laughs> okay, and um, and it was awful. It was just awful. We had this big black textbook with two columns, and every country had at least 49 political parties, Uh each of them with three or four letters, and they all sounded the same. The social public... Republican Democrats, the the Republican Socialist Democrats, the Republican Democratic Socialists, they you know, and there would be thirteen or fourteen political parties for each country, yeah. and they all had these incredible acronyms, and they all had, you know, platforms, and we did England and France and Germany and Italy, and and I hated it. It's just I, dry. It was boring. It yeah. was hideously boring and not very intelligently taught. And so, you know, I'm going to class most of the time. And so before the exam, I sat down with this big textbook that I had had not really been reading. And I read it from start to finish. Okay. And at the time of that of my life, I had a phenomenally good memory. Yeah. So I read this entire textbook. And then I walked very carefully to the final exam, making sure that my head didn't move because uh-huh. I didn't want everything to, to pour out, out <laughs> right? Yeah. I walked in to the final. I wrote the final exam. I walked out of the final, and I pushed the delete button on the whole course. I just said, I'm not remembering this, yeah. right? And I changed my major back to biology huh. at that moment. And now you should realize that at the time, I think they were... 50 or 60 bio majors in my year, and there were only four or five of us were women. So that's when I switched back to being a bio major. And you, but so, because you, you mentioned earlier that you were already thinking about going on to some other degree, whether it's going to be English or biology, but you knew you wanted to go study beyond this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So a PhD was planned. It wasn't planned necessarily. I might have gone to law school. Right? Oh, yeah, right. Right. That, you're still thinking about that? Uh, not so much. Not so much, but I might have yeah. had something else happen. So, but that you do go on to get a PhD. I don't know if you applied roundly or not. I mean, I know you went to UCSD. I applied to five places. Um, I wanted to go to the West Coast because I was busy trying to get away from my family. Uh huh. Okay. Um, and I applied to to Harvard Neurobiology because my undergraduate thesis advisor had told me it was the best place in the world, so I applied there. And there's a whole story there, but we don't need to go into that. But um, and then I applied to the University of Oregon. I was at, I was applying to where neuroscience was. I thought, even though my 
my professors were saying, oh, no, just go do molecular biology and neuroscience as a flash in the pan. It's not going to be around for very long. <laughs> that was not correct. No, but I didn't listen to them, yeah. so it didn't matter. I said, oh, yeah, okay, fine. I knew I was. So I applied to places where I knew there was some good neuroscience. So I applied to the University of Oregon, to Berkeley, to Stanford, and to UCSD. And Stanford had a known policy to only take two women in a class of 12, and they also had a known policy. They wouldn't take two undergraduates from the same institution. And I had a pretty good friend who was a molecular biologist who had made arrangements to go to Stanford, so I knew what was it to get into Stanford. Uh -huh. So I got into Oregon, Berkeley, and UCSD. And, um, and then I had to decide between those three places. So I had a very interesting decision-making process. I knew it rained a lot in Oregon, so I thought that was depressing. Yeah. So that that's out. Right? That's out. And then I had to decide between Berkeley and UCSD. And Berkeley was at the time in the midst of all this political upheaval. Right. Right? It was a really exciting place. But Berkeley made a mistake. They called me up and they said, please come to Berkeley because you're the strongest person in our applicant pool. Okay. Uh -huh. And I said, I said, I'm the, your strongest applicant? And they said, yes. So I turned them down. Yeah, because you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I went to UCSD, which at the time was very much like, I sort of felt like it was a bit of deja vu. There were a lot of people had went to UCSD faculty who had been in the Brandeis Biochemistry Department. They moved to UCSD to build this brand new um, institution. UCSD was brand new at yep. the time. Literally, I mean, Brandeis was 20 years old when I got or 15 years old, and UCSD was four years old. I mean, it was... You could smell the paint kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, everything was brand new. So um, I just sort of felt, okay, you know, this is the second time I'm doing this, going to a brand new institution with no tradition, and you just make it, you know, make your own way. Yeah. And so, and that didn't bother me at all. No, just, no, no. So, I mean, so I think in like, so you studied under Allard and Selverson then, right? right? Yeah. And then you, you had a paper come out, I think it's 75. 74 first. 74. This is about, um, you, so actually, just tell me how you started looking at neuromodulation, neurotransmitters. Okay, so I decided I wanted to do neuroscience, or neurobiology, I thought of it at the time. Uh -huh. So UCSD was one of the first places in the country to have rotations. Um, Al Selverson was a brand new assistant professor. He started at UCSD about three or four weeks after I got there. So I was Al's first student, basically. And there were a couple of us in the early in the early days, and what happened that sort of is entertaining is he went off that summer, that first summer, he went off to Bermuda where he learned the stomatogastric nervous system preparation, uh -huh. and I went off to a summer course on Catalina Island, um, which is a neuro neurobiology course, and I got back a couple of weeks before he did, so I just went back to his lab because I had decided that's where I was going to be. And I just started reading and sat down at a desk and took it over and just started reading. He got back and found me a sconce in his lab. I never asked him if I could work with him. I just moved in. And I don't think he knew how to get rid of me. <laughs> Did he try? No, he didn't really try. But... Um, you, you had found... So you're reading the things that were in his office and you thought, this is fascinating. No, I was reading neuroscience. It's reading stuff from the, from the library oh, or I whatever. See. Okay. Yeah, I was just reading. I'd go to the library and find things. So this is how you began to look at crustaceans, because Alan was doing it, yes. and you thought this yes. is a fascinating space. It was the space that was available to me. Yeah. I, you know, it was what he was doing, and it was fine. I, was, I had fallen in love with transmitters and receptors my senior in college. I, oh. I, was, I had been reading neurobiology my whole senior year, and I actually started the, my, before that. So I had decided I was gonna be a neuroscientist. And my senior year in college, I wrote a paper on denervation supersensitivity, which is processes by which acetylcholine receptors are regulated yep. and, so, and localized. So I always already had this major interest in, in transmitters. I got into my head after a certain period of time that I was gonna figure out what the transmitters in the stomatic gastric nervous system were. Because at the time, and this is very important, at the time, there were people studying serotonin and they were over there, and people studying histamine and they were over there, and people studying um, 
you know, dopamine, and they were over there, and people studying GABA, and everybody, but all these groups were separate. So there'd be somebody studying serotonin, and completely different people studying acetylcholine. And I knew, it was obvious that there were many different transmitter systems in the brain, and nobody was asking the question, well, what would that do for how circuits worked? Yeah. Right, they were busy doing it one by one. And so I said, well, okay, here's a nervous system, if I can figure out all the transmitters present in a circuit, in an entire little ensemble, maybe I'll see organizational principles that will never become clear if you um, study them one at a time. Right, and so, so this ganglion that you're studying is it had like 30 neurons, so right. it became this perfect little right. circuit that you could study everything, right? right? right. Yeah, right. yeah. So that's why I chose to do that. But I think what's important for you is that Already, as a relatively beginning graduate student, I was framing a question that nobody else had framed. I mean, it, it wouldn't have necessarily been alien, but it wasn't. But that's not the way people were working. Because because science is siloed. Because no because, one thought to link it all together. Whoa. Because at the time there was so little known about anything that you could only do things one at a time, that if you're talking about the mouse brain or a rat brain or a monkey brain, you can't even conceive of that question because yeah. there's nothing you could have done. Yeah. So it would only have been in small circuits that you could frame that question. And the problem was at the time, which made me, there were very few people who cared about the signaling molecules because the small circuit people were busy trying to what was called crack the circuit. They were trying to figure out the wiring diagrams. And they were still living in the belief that the transmitters didn't matter. They were just going to be excitatory, inhibitory, and that, and, was it. and that was it. And so even my advisor at the time said, oh, that's just pharmacology. Now, he was of the belief that he came from the tradition where graduate students did independent work and you just provided them an opportunity. So he never tried to interfere with me, but I don't think he ever thought anything much was going to come out uh, of it. He thought you were wasting your time, but that's your decision? No, he didn't think I was wasting my time, but he thought that I wasn't ever going to inform anything that he cared about. I see, I see. Um, so, so he humored me or... I mean, he helped me to some degree, but he, but I don't think he actually expected great enlightenment from it. But th there were relatively few people doing, you know, invertebrate neuropharmacology, and they were doing it in every single, very different contexts, and nobody was framing the question there the way I had framed it in my head. I was thinking, here's the circuit which has to work. Yeah. Why is it necessary for the brain to have so many different transmitters when everybody knows that synapses are either excitatory or inhibitory? That was your big question. Like, so it wasn't. What was the organizational principle that drove a circuit or drove an animal to have multiple different kinds of transmitters? Why should some of them be used here, and why should some of them be used here, and why should some of them be used elsewhere? If people think that neurons are just on or off. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Right? Yeah. So you have to put it in the context of what people were thinking in the early 70s. Yeah. And that was the day when people were still walking around with electrodes trying to figure out who was hooked to who. Yeah. You know, what the connectivity was. And that was true in, in leeches or cockroaches or locusts or wherever people, or pleurobanchia or tritonia, wherever animal people were studying, they were busy trying to identify neurons and find connectivity because they were trying to come up with what was then called a wiring diagram, which today we would call a connectome. Connectome, right. So then you kind of began, well, you, you tell me where I'm wrong, but you began to just sort of like itemize all these transmitters. You would find them, you would uh, label them so that you understood that it wasn't just on or off for neurons. That was yeah, part of the- Yeah, it was, but that, it was, took place over a longer period of time. Yeah. Because the first thing, one of the things I did as a graduate student is I bought, I went to the Sigma catalog and bought everything that had, was called a neurotransmitter. And I just dumped them on the STG. And I discovered that they all did something, and they all did something different. It, I had this notion that they were just all pushing the network around, but they were doing it differently. And then I realized that that wasn't going to tell me what neurotransmitter any given synapse was or any given cell was. And so, but I knew that they all did something, and they all did something different. Yeah. And 
then so then I started saying, well, how do I figure out what transmitter is present in each cell? And so I started doing some single cell biochemistry and physiology and stuff like that. And that that was what was constituted my thesis. Now, David Barker, who was a young scientist who had gone to the University of Oregon, um, had been a postdoc at in at Kravitz's lab, and he was very interested in neuromodulation. And he had been he had done work on octopamine as a postdoc, and then he was working on serotonin and dopamine and octopamine. And he came and visited while I was a graduate student. And I showed him my recordings, and he knew what they meant mm -hmm. better than I did. I knew that it meant that those weren't necessarily all neurotransmitters in the ganglion itself. But he had it framed in his head as if it was neuromodulation. Hmm. Um, and so I went to his lab for a year as a postdoc. And then I went to Paris to Jacques Sakiho's lab because she and Hirsch Gershenfeld and Philippe Achier, but mostly Jacques Sue, had done the absolutely most elegant, beautiful invertebrate neuro neuropharmacology that was, you know, I read these papers and they were just drop dead gorgeous. And so, so my real, the real insight about neuromodulation writ large really hit in the 80s. David was thinking about it in terms of the amines, um, but it all sort of came together in the 80s. And in, in France, you're saying specifically? No, it came when I started my own lab. Oh, okay, okay. So you came back from France, and uh... and I had learned a lot how to do a lot of things I didn't know how to do, and and I had I learned a lot of biophysics. So, and I think this is an important thing that people don't quite realize. I had come out of an invertebrate circuit lab. So the people that my advisor was talking to and the, all the, those were all the small circuit people. Mm -hmm. They were not biophysicists. The lab I went to, and so that's, and you know, I, I was interested in neurotransmitters, so I read all the stuff about transmitters, but the lab I went to in Paris at the Ecole Normale, that was a lab filled with serious biophysicists. So I got off the plane in Paris, and I didn't really speak French. I didn't speak French at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know very much biophysics. So that first year I was struggling to both learn enough biophysics to understand what those guys were really saying and doing, as well as to learn enough French, French. to be able to really handle the, the lab. Huh. That's a big year of growth then, I, I, would, I would think. Yeah, it was hard. You know, I used to go off to to parties and after three hours I'd come back and my head would be so tired. Oh, I'm sure. You know? Oh, that wall of language would just be on yeah. top of all that? No, I, I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah. And of course I had studied French in high school and yeah, and college and I, I when I studied it I could read French, I could write papers and you know perfect grammar and everything but I had had my high school French teacher had a beautiful Brooklyn accent. <laughs> she was very sweet, but she had a Brooklyn accent, and so I never really heard French. I, you know, I saw it, but I didn't hear it. So you get there, and you're like, "This isn't even." Nine sound years like later, anything. nine years later, I'm hearing stuff that I didn't know how to hear, and I had forgotten all the useless grammar that I had yeah. learned. And what I didn't do, and I, in retrospect, I should have done. I never went back to school. I should have gone back to class. For French. Because, for French. Yeah. Because I always had the sensation that there were two pieces of French in my brain, and they were just not connected. There was the French I had learned in high school, in my first year in college, that was over here. And then there was the French I was learning in the lab that was over here. And, and then, they just were not communicating. And probably even like a third French on the street that was a little more slangy than... No, my lab French was pretty oh, that, slangy. Was it was pretty slangy. Uh, so when you so you decided to come back to, to the U.S. Um, and I obviously you end up at Brandeis, but did you look at other places for to set up your lab? Yeah, yeah I, I applied to a few places. Um, I knew I want, I wanted, I really wanted to go back to New York. You did? I did. Huh. So I really, my, my dream job at the time was, was Columbia. But... That didn't work out. Um, I had an offer from Cornell, which I turned down, and largely I turned down because I couldn't, 
for two reasons. One is I couldn't face the idea of being in snowy Ithaca all yeah. as a single as a single kid coming back from Paris yeah. to Ithaca. I just couldn't face that. That's fair. And um, and it was also a more stodgy place than Brandeis was. So I just I turned down a better offer at Cornell to go back to Brandeis. Did, did that feel like I don't know? Like, like coming home at all? I mean, because you've stayed since then. So it feels like it must it, have been a good fit for you. It was a good fit, but it didn't feel like coming home. Hmm. The Brandeis that I left and the Brandeis I came back to were totally different institutions. It was only nine years. Huh. What but happened? What happened is this really exciting place that was intellectually lively um, was became poor and bedraggled and much less selective because the 67 war took a lot of money that might have gone to Brandeis and sent it to Israel uh-huh. and we had this very very uninspired president who showed no leadership and the buildings that were bright and new when I got there had never been maintained I walked into the first classroom I was teaching in, and there were five buckets capturing leaks Whoa. Right, with water. Like, yeah. So everything was bedraggled and broken down, and the students were, on average, were much less good. Because they needed to raise, because they opened up uh, to anybody to get more tuition money in? To yep. fight. Oh, I see. They, they, they're, they, they were taking 70% of their applicant pool at that point. So they're obviously still really bright kids, yeah. right? Yeah. But, they were, but the bottom half of the class was much weaker. Yeah. So, um, and it, they were much less, so they were, they were more Jewish, they were weaker, and the campus wasn't being maintained. And so there was a, and it was a different time. It was it was 1978. It wasn't it wasn't 1968, right. right? And so does it feel like it sounds like like some vitality had been lost somehow? A lot of vitality had been lost. Um, and the other thing that had happened, a lot of the faculty who had been there when I was there were still there, mm-hmm. and a lot of them were not there. And so my challenge was to figure out how to negotiate a different kind of relationship with people, relationship as an assistant professor versus a relationship as an undergraduate. So in some cases, there were people there who hadn't been there, so it was not a big deal, mm-hmm. except some of them, I think, sort of were a little suspicious because I had been there. Um, oh, like, uh, oh, you just got this job because you were uh, yeah, undergrad? Yeah, but that's probably, you know, I was the 13th person they interviewed, you know, they, it, wasn't, it wasn't that, but... Huh. But um, but also I was the first, I was actually the first real neuroscientist to be hired into the biology department, or for that matter at Brandeis. There were four or five people there who I called neuroscientists, but they didn't self-identify as neuroscientists. Hmm. So I was the first real neuroscience hire. So that was the other piece of it. You know, I was walking into a department that was known for genetics and molecular biology and developmental biology, but not neuroscience. And there was nothing called neuroscience on campus. Well, obviously, Brandeis did the right thing because you have done remarkable work at the school since then. But the field was changing. I mean, you know, so the field was blowing up too. Yeah, yeah. So I played a, an important role in building the neuroscience programs at Brandeis at a time that the field was blowing up internationally. Yeah. So So I want to ask about, so this was in like 93, so we jumped ahead in time, but like you did things like the dynamic clamp, which, right. you know, was kind of, it's just like a tool that everyone then began to use. It really helped the field advance right yeah and i think you did that with larry abbott who was right. like a mentee of yours yeah sort of sort of i don't know if you can call a full professor i don't know a mentee. But I, I mean i had read some things from him where he seemed to be suggesting that um you might have led the way on that i don't know you, you, no, you tell I, me i taught so when i met larry he was a very young full professor in the physics department so he's a year or two younger than i am so yeah. we were peers yeah and we sort of met a little bit by accident because he had a graduate student and I had a graduate student who had the same fellowship, the Gillette Fellowship. The Gillette Company had given money. Uh-huh. And they always had a lunch for those kids. And the two of them went to the same lunch. And um, 
they were asked to stand up and say three words about what they were doing. And Tom Kepler, who's a physics student, Larry's student, said, oh, yeah, I work on memory and neural networks. And Jim Wyman, my guy, said, hey, I work in the nervous system. What you do has nothing to do with it. And so um, Jim dragged Tom back to our lab, and Tom took one look at what we were doing, and he ran across Red Square and got Larry and said, you have to come look. Uh -huh. And that's how we basically met. Um, so, I mean, I, we sort of vaguely knew about each other, but it was when Larry physically saw experiments in motion that he realized that's what he wanted to do. And that he had become interested in potentially moving into a new area because the work he had been doing was sort of dependent on them building the super collider in mm -hmm. Texas, and they decided not to. So he was, he said, I'm too young to wait for 15 years for something you're not going to do. Yeah. So, so he became interested. So in that first six months, he would, he would read, and then he'd come by and ask questions, and we would talk. And then he started doing some work with us. And so in the, between 90 and 93, um, he learned a tremendous amount of neuroscience. And so the dynamic clamp really came about um, between us. It was a true collaboration. Yeah. Okay. Well, just take me through. I mean, I, I sort of have a basic understanding of what it does, but I don't know how you, you built it. Was that Larry's sort of physics part to make the device itself? No, it was my technician. Ah. I had a very good technician who's very good with early computers. So it's basically, there's no real device. It's just a program that tells the computer what to do. And... At the time, we were working with very slow, stupid computers. So my then technician wrote the code for doing the original dynamic clamp in machine language. He actually wrote it in ones and zeros. Based on what you and Larry were saying, we need to do this. And he said, yeah. I can do that. Yeah. Huh. So it's a very simple idea. It turns out that every ion channel opens and closes as a function of voltage and time. Yeah. And... Hodgkin Huxley first wrote down equations that described the voltage time dependence opening and closing of ion channels. And so the idea behind the dynamic clamp was very simple. It was that if you had those, those equations were in many computers because people had built simulations. I mean, going back to Hodgkin Huxley, had built simulations of these, of currents. And so the idea was that if you had a simulated equation in the computer, if you recorded from the cell, and then the computer could tell you what the current would be through that conductance at that voltage, and then you'd inject that current into the cell. So basically, you're just moving a model of the current into the neuron and giving it that current, and then that current will interact with the voltage of the cell, and yep. then that'll update the... So you have to go back and forth between the computer and the cell really quickly. And, and so at the time, the boards we had and the computers we had weren't fast enough to do this in DOS or whatever the hell, or in Fortran. So Michael actually took that whole process and wrote the code in, in machine language. That's kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, so I did. I want to ask you this other thing, too, about... Uh, I think this is based off of like a 2012 paper from you where you had sort of written out that not only are neurons these, in these circuits, but they can be modulated and also that they can be reconfigured, right? Which I think was a new thought also at the time. Well, circuit reconfiguration, we'll have to go back. We were saying in the early to middle 80s that what modulators did was they reconfigured circuits. Yeah. Okay. Then it was in the early 90s that Larry and I came up with the first idea of these activity-dependent homeostatic you know, self-tuning models, yeah. and that's, yeah. and then, and I think that's what you're talking about. Is that what you're talking about? I'm, I, I'm talking about that versus um, like the connectome, where you've sort of taken almost like a snapshot of the brain, and here's the way all the parts of the brain are related. But you would argue that that isn't, that doesn't stay forever, and these things can be reconfigured. And if you actually want to understand the brain, you have to understand both of those things: the way it's connected, and also the way that these circuits can be reconfigured. Well, yes, but the, the problem, so there are two parts with that. One is, assume you have a connectome, an anatomical connectome. Yeah. 
what I would say today, no matter how stable the anatomical connectome is, it doesn't give you enough information to know how it's going to work because every single synapse is susceptible to change either via modulation or via use and every single current is susceptible to change as well. So the connectome gives you this backbone and then you've got all of these little knobs that are changed by experience and modulation. So to understand what the dynamics are, you have to know what all those knobs are telling you. Um, and that, I think, is the big problem. Right, in that there's all this connectome work going on, but it is not being melded to the way the neuromodulation will affect things. It's not just ne it's neuromodulation and prior activity history. Because huh. even forgetting neuromodulation, how active a neuron was in the five minutes or the two hours before you look at that moment in time will change its synaptic strength and hmm. the properties of its channels. So it's, it's prior history over a whole range of time scales as well as neuromodulation and the way neuromodulation and experience interact that sets the, the, the knobs and the dials that then tell you how that connectome is actually gonna be played out. And so that's, that's a really deep, deep, deep problem. And here's, you, you haven't asked the hard question or the easy question. You haven't asked why I've stuck with this small circuit for all these years. Actually, that's a great question. I right. should have asked that, yeah. Right. Yeah. And the reason is, when we record from this circuit, we always know what it's doing. We always know who's doing what to whom in terms of the cells and their interactions. And we know when it's got it right and when it's got it wrong, right? We know, if, okay. Whereas if you try and understand cortex, you never know when, it, yeah. when it's gotten it right, yeah. you know? You can put as many electrodes as you want in a rat brain or a mouse brain and still not really know how the circuit the circuit's dynamics really map on to behavioral dynamics and cognition. So that ambiguity, so I stay where I can say, okay, I do this and this and this to the circuit and I see this behavior and I can do this and this and this and this and I see a no change in behavior or a change in behavior. So I, I have, I'm anchored in some way in a, in a real world. Um, that's why I stay there. Because the answers you get, you are sure of the answers. Yeah. yeah. Or I'm sure of where the ambiguity is. Yeah. It's, I mean, I don't necessarily know for sure, for sure, but I know exactly where the ambiguities are. Yeah. Um, there's a few things I want to ask you. One is the Lessons from the Lobster, the book that was written. And it was kind of like a, kind of like a biography, but you, you had a hand in it too, I think, right? I mean, you were we a talked, main source. I talked yeah. to Charlotte a lot. Yeah. Um, what did you make of that process? Were you happy with the results? Yes and no. I mean, probably more yes than no because a lot of people said they liked it. Yeah. Um, probably, I probably feel the same way about this interview again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a similar sort of thing. I really like Charlotte. Yeah. She's really smart. She put a tremendous amount of her life into that book. Um, and so, and I don't think she did any disservice to me. Where where um, what she did, I don't know if you figured this out from the preface or whatever, she just cold wrote to me. And then we, and I, I met her and I liked her and so we started talking. Um, so more or less everybody who's ever said anything to me about the book says they like it. That said, it's in her voice, not my voice. Right. So, th so that was my thought. So, I th I think all the things you just said. She, um, you liked her. She worked really hard on it. She tried her best. All those things. But it's still kind of your story being filtered through someone else. So you're probably never going to think it's 100 percent right. And she, maybe she can't get it 100 percent right. How could she? How could she? Right. But it still does this great service to a lay audience or readers who want to know more about your career and your work. So you like it for those reasons, but you feel like, I mean, if you had done it, it would have been different, of course, because you know exactly every turn of the story. Right, and she captured 
you know, she did, I think she probably got it close to 90%. I mean, she did a really good job. Yeah, yeah. And I have to give her enormous credit. She did something that blew me away. She came, she would come to my lab. She sat there for a week at a time, a number of times. She read all my lab notebooks. Now, I still have my lab notebooks from graduate school. So she found things in my lab notebooks because when I was a graduate student, I used to write down all my thoughts in my lab notebooks. So she knew what I was thinking, and she found things I had forgotten. You mean your general thoughts or just about the science? About the science. Okay, yeah. Okay. They weren't like journals like that. No, they weren't yeah. journals. They okay. were they were lab notebooks. But they were lab notebooks. But yeah. they lab notebooks with plans for experiments or ideas about experiments or ideas about about the nervous system. Yeah. I mean, it was all there. Yeah. And she read it all. And so that's why she got it as right as she did. But she actually found things I had just completely forgotten. Mm. And it was really amazing. And I, I have to really give her credit that she approached it more as a historian than as a biographer. Yeah. And she, she said it was never really a biography of me so much as a history of, of a story. And I think if you think about it that way, it makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, I yes, I have a tremendous amount of respect for yeah. her. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask this too. So so we, we were talking earlier, like, so, you know, you've won the Gruber Prize, Kavli Prize, you, National Academy of Sciences, National Medal of Science, you were the past president of SFN, um, you were on Obama's work group for the Brain Initiative, I think. I mean, you've had this long career obviously storied career. And so I was reading your bio, the, the essay that you wrote for the Kavli Prize. And in there you had mentioned that uh, some of the things we just talked about, you did not get into Stanford, uh, you didn't get into Radcliffe, that you were had been in France, and uh, sometimes the cabbies were rude and would pretend to not understand your French. People told you you shouldn't go to France, it's gonna hurt your career, you know, which obviously didn't. And I had this thought that, um, you may have felt that you were underestimated for a lot of your life. And I could think of reasons why. You know, you were young to go to college. They didn't need another Jewish person. You were a woman in a male-dominated field. And I wondered if there were times where you felt that you were underestimated or people underestimated your abilities. I wouldn't call it underestimated exactly. I was, I would call it more under-acknowledged. Hmm. Okay. Um, Dismissed? Yeah, ignored. I mean, as a young woman in the day, I had the experience that many women have discussed, where you'd stand in a room with you and nine other guys, and you'd say something, and no one would respond, and then the guy next to you would say the same thing. And they'd, and they'd say, respond. Oh, they'd say, oh, that's a really good idea, right? And there were always some, some men who'd say, she said that, and others who just took credit. And so... One of the things that I learned in those years, which I probably didn't have to go very far to learn, was I got pretty good at interrupting people and fighting back. And, and so that turned, in other words, the only defense one really had, there were two defenses one had, and women in my generation had one or the other of them. One is to be like me and become pretty assertive, which was probably more in my nature. And the other defense was just to be so much of a lady and to do it with politeness. And there are people who did that or yeah. who had certain kind of class and they would do it all differently. But um, I just would, would fight. So, um, you know, I think the irony is that those of us who really came through that time were very stubborn and it came through in many different ways, but it had to be very stubborn. It mm -hmm. had to be pretty impervious to certain kinds of dismissal. Um, I mean, otherwise you'd wash out? Like if you didn't stake your claim, you'd wash out? You wouldn't necessarily wash out, but you wouldn't be heard. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily be completely driven out of science, but you'd be under-acknowledged. I wrote a piece which didn't get published, but where I said that Every young scientist wants to be heard hmm. and wants to, if they have a, a new idea, wants other people to resonate, to, you know, you want to speak your mind and change the way people think about something, right? 
And so if you're not heard, then how can you change the way people think about things? And so it's not so much a fear of washing out, it's a fear of not being heard. Mm. And the irony is, I actually struggle more today with speaking my mind than I have for the mm. last 30 years. Mm. Which you would think someone who's reached your stature would have less trouble speaking out. You'd almost be, you know, impervious to it because I'm impervious, but they, but I've been told to keep my mouth shut more times in the last three years than in my whole career. Huh. I'll tell you this story, but I'll tell it to you. It's a very nuanced story. So I was not so long ago, I was at a Gordon conference and they had their their professional development session which are now very and I don't go to them anymore because yeah. anyway but this was just right at the very tail end of COVID or just heading into COVID I don't remember I think it was right at the very tail end of COVID um, and the the young people were saying oh we don't feel supported and so often I say well what does that mean and then you discover that what they're talking about is, is an angst right and you know, there's nothing I can do about their angst. Right? I can I can provide real help, but I can't I can't answer their angst. Yeah. So we were going on at some point and they were talking about they need role models and they need mentoring and I'm thinking and I said something. What I said was, um, if you want to be a, everyone in this room wanted to be wants to be a scientist. And you do science because you wanna be the first person in the world to do something, see something, describe something, think something, say something, convince the world that they should think of something differently. And I said, so that means you have to be willing to be a leader. And your willingness to being a leader means, I mean, implied in what I was saying that you don't need to follow someone, mm -hmm. a role model. You need to say, I want to change the way people think about something. I want to be the first to, to know something. And then I want to be the first to tell people what I've learned. That's why you write papers. That's why you give talks. Because you think you have something to say that no one has said before. Or no one has said quite that way before. And whether it's a little thing or a big thing or a very big thing, it's still the thrill is to be the first person in the world to actually do something no one's ever done quite that way before. Yeah. And it could be a little thing, yeah. but it's still, it's something that you've done that no one had ever done before. Or you saw something that no one's ever seen before. And I watch it when people in my lab do that. You know, they do something and they say, oh, look at that, you know? So when I said this at this meeting, somebody raised their hand and said, that's all very well and good for you to say, but it was so much easier when you were young. And I thought at that point I just gave up. Because anybody to say to a, a woman of my generation that it was easier when we were starting. Did they mean, did they mean that, uh, that there's some d different challenges now that they, were, they, they weren't talking about males versus females the way that you had to come through that. They must have been talking about some other challenge or was it the same challenge? I think they just thought that we had it easy. And how you could say that to a woman of my generation it just shows they had no understanding of what it was really like. Of what it was really like. Yeah. And, you know, they really thought I was just being, um, you know, that my life was so easy. And it was easier in some ways. Um, and harder in some and ha ways. And harder sure. in other ways. And, yeah. it's, and it's not like it was easy. It's, and it's not like... And all the people who were, who are today complaining about the lack of role models and mentoring and all that, those people probably all were lost, right? And we probably lost some very good people who needed a little more help than they got. Yeah. But the people who made it didn't make it because it was easy. They made it because they were stubborn and determined and just didn't give up. <laughs> Right, and and the stubbornness and determination came through in all sorts of different ways. They all had different styles, but but they were just very determined. And that's why you made it. And that's why I made it. Yeah, it's just you know a certain kind of determination. 
So it made me very sad, and that's in the same way, you know. Um, we were taught to expect that if you gave a talk, you'd get challenging questions, and you had to be prepared to deal with that. And then for people to tell me that I should never ask a challenging question, I find very dispiriting. And I haven't told that in, in so many words. Stop asking difficult questions? Yeah. Me meaning, but you could you could ask Larry a difficult question. They're saying don't ask younger people difficult questions because... But how else are they going to learn? Yeah, I, I don't know. But that's what Some people say this. Yeah. That's what they're saying, but they might even say I shouldn't ask Larry difficult <laughs> questions. And he's, of course, nicer than I am. So he probably can ask difficult questions in a in a very friendly way. Yeah. And... And I think part of and part of it is that if you're in the back of a room and you're female, this goes back to the old thing. If I ask a difficult, I ask a question from the back of the room, it's still heard as challenging. Whereas if Larry asks it, you know, it's a male voice and he's he's more polite or whatever. They don't they don't hear it the same way. That still happens. I think it still happens. Even though you're you. Yes. Wow. I think so. I think so. I mean. Um, so, so, you know, I, I've learned to be a little nicer, but I'm not sure it serves much function because if the determination isn't there, you know, they're not going to make it. Yeah. Uh, that's the only, that's the last question I had. We're good. We're good. All right. Loved this interview. Loved it. Especially the end, where it felt like we'd gotten down to a, a certain point of view that I had not ever previously inhabited. When I shut the mics off, I talked with Eve for a little while longer. But by then, her husband was reminding her of all the things they still needed to do that day. So I packed up and got out of there. Arthur walked me down out of the building and along the streets of the North End until we passed the statue for Paul Revere. And I veered off to, to read the history. And later, I got an email from Eve saying that she felt like we could have talked for another hour. I definitely agree with that. Something about her long view on neuroscience and her willingness to speak her mind on science and politics and everything else made me want to keep asking her questions. So thank you, Eve, for a great talk. This episode will be archived on thetransmitter.org, where we also have a transcript. In the transcript, we have inserted links to the main papers that we discussed, so check that out if you'd like more information. The show can be found wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or in whatever podcast app you use. Some of the information on Brandeis for the intro was sourced from the university's website. If you'd like to comment on this show or whatever we do at The Transmitter, you can find us on the social media platforms X, Blue Sky, Mastodon, and LinkedIn. Our theme song was written and performed by Chris Collinwood. Thank you for listening to Synaptic. Until next time. Well, let's see. Yeah, that's better. Okay. You got it? Yep. Or do you want to share this one? No. We'll, we'll get two lines going in.